Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's teaching session on total hip arthroplasty in the dysplastic hip challenges and solutions. This is a combined session with OR UK and tonight we're privileged to welcome Mr. Satish Kuti as our guest lecturer. Mr. Satish Kuti is a consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon at the Princess Alexander Hospital um, in Harlow in the UK. He's clinical lead and clinical director of his department. He's been clinical lead since 2014. Mr. Cutty specializes in all aspects of hip surgery with a particular focus on complex arthroplasty of the hip and knee, including revisions of the hip and young adult hip surgery, including hip arthroscopy. During his training, he's won numerous awards which have, con and has, which have contributed to fellowships in Austria, Switzerland, Germany, and Canada. Mr. Cutty's had numerous publications and is a reviewer. He's a primary editor for the Bone and Joint Journal. He takes a very keen interest in training and remains active in the regional orthopaedic training programs. In recognition for his contribution, he was voted trainer of the year for the Percival Pot training program in 2016 and 17. He is also the Royal College of Surgeons of England surgical tutor. I'm sure Mr. Cutty has a lot to teach us this evening and his experience as a clinician and a trainer will be valuable to everyone. This evening, uh, we have myself, Nikki Evans, and we have Ruth and Hannah from OR UK, as well as our mentors, Swan, Honey, and Samir. The program for this evening will be a lecture by Mr. Cutty, followed by um, an MCQ poll and uh, invited questions. Your answers to the polling are anonymous, and we ask that you complete these as promptly as possible so we can move on to the um, invited questions and then on to some case discussions and top tips for the FRCS exam. If you do have any questions, please write them in the chat box and we will monitor this and ask Mr. Cutty after the polling. When the teaching is concluded, we'll stop the recording and we'll progress to the Viva practice. This is a popular session and we ask that you raise your hand and message myself, Ruth and Hannah if you'd like to participate. Please state when you're taking the exam and priority will be given to those sitting in November. Please do this as early as possible and we will confirm with you via the chat. We will try to accommodate as many volunteers as possible within the time frame. For those candidates who missed out on the FLCS Mock 5 course on September the 19th, we have opened another course on the 10th of October which has places available. So I'd ask you all to mute your microphones and without any further delay, I will pass you over to Mr. Cutty. Many thanks. So my aim is to talk about arthroplasty in the dysplastic hip and it's, uh, it's a failure to mine because uh, uh, I have a keen interest in arthroplasty, uh, challenging solutions, uh, especially in this type of problem. So why is it a problem? If you uh, look at what we see nowadays, uh, you hardly see patients on the left. Uh, with no operations because young adult hip um, is, is certainly a subspecialty on its own and we treat patients, I treat patients with, with young adult hip problems and they end up having multiple operations uh, and at the end the straightforward hip is no longer there. Uh, they often have severe deformities, their biomechanics are completely distorted as, you, as I will show you with, uh, with examples later on. Uh, and a fair amount of these, because of the excessive amount of bone changes, the medullary canal is completely obliterated, making it a very difficult to insert a component. Uh, and on top of that, when you have retained metalwork of all multiple years, it's quite hard to remove them, uh, and that becomes an extreme challenge. So uh, I hope you all know what the lateral centrage angle is and the normal is between 25 and 39. If your lateral centrage angle, as you can see from this, this is how it's measured. Uh, from the center of the femoral head, you draw a vertical line and then from the very center to the edge of the acetabulum, that subtended angle should be between that. If it's less, it's dysplastic and then you have a very high risk of osteoarthritis. And my mentor, Professor Gans, has written numerous papers on dysplasia and he's clearly showed that if you don't um, uh, assess this and manage this problem, they get arthritis very early. And there's another angle which I'd like to bring to your attention, which is not the lateral, but the anterior one, uh, which is taken in a special way. Uh, it's called the false profile view. And this anterior edge, uh, if it's also less than uh, 20, uh, 25, you got to really worry because uh, in dysplastic hips is often the anterior column and the anterior wall which is really dysplastic and you need to understand that 
uh, especially when you're reconstructing uh, for osteoarthritis. So that's a young person. And if, you, if this patient is not addressed early on, we'll go on to get arthritis for sure. Here's uh, Sikule. So this is a patient uh, over four years, how rapidly has progressed uh, from um, having some cartilage to severe osteoarthritis. So how rapidly they progress. So if they're not addressed early on, that's a problem. But by the time they come to you, you have all these issues. Uh, luckily, this patient didn't have any metal work in or any operation. So it's a reasonably easy uh, total hip arthroplasty to perform. This is the issue. Now, this is a young patient. This is not my patient. It's, okay. it's one of my boss's patients. 97, she's 24 years old, or severe osteoarthritis. And had a hip, had a, uh, hip replacement. Um, and then uh, within seven years, you can see the poly is worn out. And by 32 years old, uh, he's already had first revision. So this is the scale of the problem that we face. Uh, but implants have changed. Uh, we have far better biomaterials. So we are hopeful that the, second, the first revision may last because it's a ceramic and highly crossing poly bearing revision. So this is uh, Professor Hartafilakidis. So he doesn't believe in DDH. He said these people are born and he feels it should be named as congenital hip disease. Uh, I, had the, I had the kind of uh, privilege of working with him. So I've learned a lot from him about his thinking. Um, uh, and what you should remember, the acetabulum and the femur, even though they are linked, they each has its own problems. And they have deficiencies. You have superior, anterior, anterior column. These are the ones that severely affect how you manage these patients. And as a result of where the hip is lying, the soft tissues are very contracted. The abductors are not functioning well. And sciatic and femoral nerve have issues because they are quite contracted. And when you lengthen or bring it to where that acetabular component should sit and bring the femoral component down into it, you're stretching neuro neurological structures. And there's a limit to how much, how much you can stretch these structures uh, because they will, they will have a neurological compromise if, if you stretch it way beyond what uh, you're allowed to. On the femoral side, uh, the, it, it, again, it's, it's hypoplastic. Uh, it's a very small canal. The femoral head is very small. You have leg length in the issues. The version is completely changed. Uh, and with hardware and deformity, it becomes a significant challenge to address this problem. So classification. And classification is important. And as we always find out during our training, why do we talk about classification? Classification is essentially to understand the severity of the disease and for each, what do you, how do you manage each uh, one of those, you know, those classified uh, uh, subgroups and also to communicate results. And if you don't uh, have uh, some sort of way of doing it, it becomes a problem. So there are two very popular um, classifications that are used. I'm sure everyone knows these. The first one is the Crove and the other one is the Hartophilokides. Now, Crove, if you type in PubMed, the amount of uh, uh, references to Crove is huge, whereas Hartofilkidis is not that much. Uh, my personal feeling is to, the, to do with the fact that people find it very difficult to pronounce the name Hartofilkidis, and that's why they tend to err on using Crove, which is very easy to pronounce. Now, who's Crove? So we're going to come there. So, sorry. So, in Crove, what, what he's done is he, he measured the proximal migration of the femoral head diameter. Okay, and now this is uh, in relation to the inter tear drop. So, uh, for one, it's less than 50% of the diameter, uh, two is 50 to 75%. So, this is the image. So this, this is the, on, the one on the left where you see is the amount of migration of the femoral head in relation to the tear drop. So, 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100, and over 100. That's crow one to four. Uh, whereas uh, this is his, his classic paper, which has been quoted all the way through. And who is Crow? Uh, if you Google and find out, Crow's a hand surgeon now, and uh, he works in Grinch Hospital uh, in the US. Uh, and he, his fellowship with Chitranavat is what resulted in that article. I was fortunate to work with Professor uh, Hartafilkidis during my training, and I visited his hospital in Athens. That's CAT Hospital in Athens, very busy hospital. 
and they have a significant amount of dysplasia that they treat. So it's very simple, dysplasia where the femoral head is subluxed, but it's still inside the original sub acetabulum. Now your low dislocation where it is outside the uh, uh, true acetabulum in a false acetabulum, but just partially overlap the true acetabulum. That's low dislocation. And high is where there's no contact uh, and is way high up. So those are the images. So that A is dysplasia, B is low dislocation where there is still some very little contact, but it's still outside the true acetabulum and high is outside and in, in a false acetabulum. So Bill Harris commented, um, and this is uh, Professor Harta Filiki, this is a slide where he said that uh, they found this a far more effective classification than Crow. Uh, so I would encourage you to use this because it's far more easy to, to understand and to discuss. So um, in the dysplastic type, what do you do? Um, so it's normally a very ovoid acetabulum. There's good bone quality. Uh, and you can put in standard acetabular components without a problem, majority of the time. Very rarely you do, you do need screw augmentation to just support it for the first six weeks, by which time you get bone on growth or ingrowth into the acetabular component, and then it's fine. But remember where you place it is very important. Never try to place it high, because there's clear evidence that if you place your acetabular component high up, it will fail. So aim for where it should sit. And then you need to address how are you going to manage the area which is uncovered. And that's how you decide on what sort of uh, components you use. So here's, a, uh, here's one um, in my second year, which was 2011, uh, or second, 12 actually, uh, dysplastic hip, straightforward. And you can see the amount of uncoverage uh, that's going to be there. Uh, I've kind of, usually these established components are very small. At uh, that time, uh, we didn't have electronic templating, so it was all um, a hand on a printed x-ray sheets. Um, whereas now, we have uh, modern software, which tells you what to do and how much of lengthening you need to do a shortening of the femur if required. So this is that first case that I showed you, and you can see the area of uncoverage, um, the acetabulum, and that's when you put the femoral component in, you can see the amount uncovered. And this, this patient is very solid. Still, I just felt that there was a slight give. Um, and so I augmented this with screws uh, to support the component. And that's that patient before and after. And this is a nine-year x-ray. Uh, so she's done in 2011 and she's doing extremely well. In low dislocation, now this is, uh, this is the one out of the two that you often find quite difficult. So you end up, uh, it's quite easy to put a, a component in, but you have a significant area which is not covered. How do you address that area which is not covered? So you could do its structural grafting with the femoral head that you've taken out, uh, or you do control perforation, which is the cotyloplasty, which is uh, hardly done from my understanding, or you keep where the hip is meant to be at a high hip center, which again, I say, I, I would encourage you not to, or you use acetabular onguents, which is fairly new. There's hardly any literature uh, for uh, primary hip placement. There's plenty for revisions, but in primary, I haven't seen it much in terms of the use of augments and the results. So here's uh, how you can put in a structural allograft, which is usually a flying buttress. So you uh, shape the allograft as a figure of seven. So if that's a hemisphere, you cut an L shape off, and so that becomes a figure of seven, and that is placed at the edge of the acetabulum, screwed in place, and then you ream the acetabular socket. Um, and just like this, so that's the uh, femoral head uh, screwed into place. You ream that, uh, and then you place your component uh, inside your acetabulum, which is the ream. Uh, results are pretty good, but it's technically quite difficult because you need a fine line between uh, unloading it uh, and unloading it. So if it's overloaded, it will disappear. If it's unloaded, it will disappear. So uh, you've got to be really careful as to how, uh, you, how, how it works. And I'll show you one of mine, which I thought didn't work initially, but then uh, it seems okay at the moment. So it can fail because it can resolve very quickly. So, uh, so, sorry. 
So here's mine. And this patient, uh, as you can see, I placed the femoral head first, um, use a K wire to place it, uh, to make sure it doesn't move, fix that with screws, and then ream it to place your component. So this is what, uh, as I said, was uh, quite poor, I thought initially, but this X-ray is taken nine years, eight or nine years, and it's still there. But so if you don't place it properly and the screw direction should be quite parallel to these screws so that it doesn't uh, resorb and the loading is perfect. So that's an issue. It's a technical problem, so it's very difficult to get right. So I've moved away from this, so I tend to use um, uh, augments uh, as required. So here's one uh, where I've uh, used uh, much bigger screws and this seems to have worked and it's a much smaller patient. Uh, so uh, it can work and it can fail. Cotyloplasty is very controversial. Now, a lot of people in, in have, have done it and Hartofilicatus uh, has reported quite a lot. Uh, and uh, the people that he, uh, the, that I would credit those to is, this is Professor Santos. Uh, so that was his right-hand man, and he's the one who championed cotyloplasty. Whereas Nicholas Bola um, from Vienna, he uh, feels that it was the Austrians and the Germans who, who popularized it. So that's Perrin, uh, Perna, sorry. Perna is the one who kind of, who, who has written a lot about this and how he's shown is that's the threaded screw cup, how, uh, you, you perforate the medial wall and it's pushed inside and the cup goes in, in the defect. It's quite difficult for me to do and I find, I think many will find it quite difficult. Uh, and this is another image of how you can uh, perforate the medial cortex and fix that with a cup and some screws. So that is an option, um, uh, but it's rarely used. Uh, this is the one that is quite popular and a lot of uh, revision hip surgeons and hip surgeons use this, it's called the flying buttress augment uh, and it's a, it's a revision hip um, it's a classification from Poprosky, the type 3a segmental defect which is quite easy to manage with uh, an augment so here's a case where in a dysplastic hip you i put the trial in just to see how much is not exposed that's a fair amount exposed i've used augment trials to see what fits best so you can either put the cup in first and then the augment, and you can unitize the two either using cement or bone graft. I tend to use graft where possible, uh, or in this position where you, if you feel you can put the augment in first, then you put the uh, stable component and then try to unitize that where, with graft. And that's the final position. And, and the case that I showed you before, this is a 44-year-old lady who's had a shelf operation procedure for dysplasia done and by one of my senior colleagues many years ago, uh, and that's how she is, and that's how she is now. And uh, that's a seven year follow up, and that augment has done really well. So, this is another way of trying to manage these kind of complex scenarios uh, where uh, you need superior support. So, this is for the low dislocation. Uh, high dislocation, um, uh, this, this is challenging for, not from the acetabular side, but from the femoral side. And the acetabular side is really small. So you've got to make sure that your standard components um, that you have on your shelf don't usually fit. It's, you, it's, it's in the 40 millimeter size range that often uh, you have to put it. So you have to get the micro system in uh, for these uh, procedures. And often for it's 42, uh, 44, uh, very rarely for things in, in high dislocation. It's often 40, 42 that you have to use. And because the size of the acetabular component, you end up using even thinner if the plastic inserts uh, or liners and uh, heads. So I end up using ceramic uh, liners for these patients. And uh, for the femoral side, you because it's quite high, it's quite tight and you need to really do an osteotomy. And this is from the paper I'm going to show. And I would encourage you to look at this surgical treatment um, uh, the JBJS American uh, from um, Mayo Clinic Rochester, uh, which gives you a very good view of how to do it. Uh, and uh, it's exactly how uh, I tend to do mine. And uh, this is from their article, how they have done a subtrochantric osteotomy. They brought the hip center normal and they've used the femoral, the allegra, the graft from where they've done the osteotomy uh, to help with further bone healing. And this is from our uh, uh, center in Exeter, where they even cemented uh, 
uh, cup and stems do work in this kind of situation and they have got very good results. A small cohort of patients, but just show you that it does work. For me, the biggest problem to, for is that when you, after you've done your osteotomy, the uh, diameter of the proximal fragment and the inferior fragment is not the same. And unless you get a very tight seal, you will get cement uh, leaking in between into the osteotomy side and it may not heal. So I, I, I find it very difficult as a skill. So I tend not to do this. So this is Professor Hartel Fertofilikidis' diagram where he feels that you, this is how you should do it, the one on the left, where you take the head, the neck, um, and part of the lesser trochanter off and you keep the greater trochanter and then you reattach the greater trochanter onto the uh, distal, uh, onto, the, onto the femoral uh, segment. Whereas I feel, he feels that this one, subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy, is not the way to do it. Uh, but I find that this is much better because your, your abductors are there intact with the shaft and they work very well. And I'll show you how I do that. So here's one of mine. And this is a 46-year-old uh, lady with bilateral CDH. Uh, and uh, this one, how you do it, that's, a, that's the false acetabulum. And then you go further down, you'll find the true acetabulum. So I do the osteotomy first to allow me to see because it's out here that the acetabulum sits. If you don't do the osteotomy beforehand, sometimes it's quite difficult to see the true acetabulum. Um, and that's uh, how much of uh, segmental removal I've done gradually to see how much I can uh, uh, take off to reduce uh, the hip joint without too much tension. And that's what it looks like uh, immediate post-op, both sides. And that's an eight year follow up where the bone graft has kind of incorporated really well. So as I've told you, the high hip center, there's clear evidence that if you leave it there, it will fail because the abductors don't function really well. The loads are pretty high uh, and there's impingement. Uh, the patient uh, is not very comfortable in that, in that uh, kind of position. So bio, biggest issue is biomechanical and there is evidence that it will fail. Um, and as I've said again, there's high uh, rate of loosening and Mark McMahon has shown that. So it is best to place it in its true center so the biomechanics uh, will work. Uh, there are some other ways of doing it. So if it's a very dysplastic, you could use oblong cups. There is some evidence that it does work. Uh, that's one of mine. Um, I done some time ago. Uh, this is during uh, my uh, first year as a consultant uh, and it did work. Uh, but I, I felt that the augments did a much better job. Uh, so this is another option for you to use. Now the femoral reconstruction, I, I think that's the one most more challenging, um, especially in the high dislocations, because the other two uh, uh, parts, are the, the other two types, the straightforward dysplastic one and the low dislocation, you can manage reasonably well. So you need to understand where it is, where you have the deformity, and this is from uh, Dan Berry's paper, and I would encourage you to um, look at where the site, what sort of geometry there is, the etiology, and then you can decide how you're going to manage the type of deformity and what sort of components you require. And that is absolutely key because not one component will fit uh, all the types. So here's uh, um, uh, one of mine, and this is the problem because this patient has about eight operations on the right. And this one has had this done when she was a child and she's now in her 40s. How are you going to find this metalwork? This is a bladed plate uh, put in, and often the screws are so buried in, uh, you're going to think hard how you're going to take this off. Um, and the patient from the first one on the left, as soon as you when I went in and I did the osteotomy, uh, I couldn't see the canal. It was completely obliterated. So it was a hard, round segment of bone, uh, not like what you would see normally. So the medullary canal uh, can be very difficult uh, to manage if you have this uh, sort of problem. So uh, CT scan, uh, you can uh, do to help you, especially to assess the torsion, the rotational aspect. Um, leg lengths to see how much you can length, how much you need to lengthen to equalize this late, late, these patients. So planning is an absolute must. And CT scan of the hip and the knee, uh, I feel, does uh, add a significant amount of information uh, and 3D reconstructions to help. So this is, sorry, that was that patient um, uh, from before. And if you look at her 3D CTs, um, if it plays, I'm sure going to play. 
So the amount of deformity this patient has um, and how are we going to address this with a standard stem is the question. So this is her uh, femur. She's had about four to five operations on both sides, the established side and the femoral side. And if you take the cross section of, the, uh, of her acetabulum, you can see there's hardly any anterior wall. Uh, and the anterior column is quite uh, uh, hyperplastic. And when your knee is externally rotated, so this patient has severe torsional abnormality. And in fact, if you, if you add the two together, where the, the foot, the knee, and the, the, the hip sits, you can see how much of retroversion she has. So you may need to consider how you're going to place a component because if you place it anatomically, there is a chance that these could dislocate. Uh, and that's the planning and the type of stem uh, you could use. And I decided to use a, uh, um, a special um, design stem for her because I, could, I didn't think I could manage the deformity with a straight stem. Um, so it was a custom design for this lady. And that's how she is on the table. And you can clearly see that the knee is pointing up in a, in a lateral position. So it's the amount of torsional abnormality she has. So this is where you need to think outside the box. And I really tried to fit the implant to the patient and not the patient to the implant. Uh, so these are unique solutions. Uh, they are expensive and that you need, that, that's something you need to have a, a conversation with your commissioners. Uh, because if they get sent to a specialist center, often uh, the cost is even higher. So uh, that's how you can justify doing it in centers where you have a fair amount of volume. So that's the stem I used and that's the rasp. Both are kind of custom design ones and, was, uh, and that's how she is. And it's a little rotated view, but it is another view where you can see that it sits in the middle, but because of the torsion abnormality, it was abutting the lateral cortex. But this is a three year results. So I'm pretty happy with how she is. Um, first time she walked with a, a, a foot pointing forwards, which never happened uh, since her childhood. So you need to evaluate how much of torsion abnormality there is. Uh, and if it's, it's a torsion abnormality, straight stems don't work. So you need to consider radiological, uh, so you can consider alternative stems to help with this problem. Uh, and if it's, if it's more than 45, where you, where, when we do total hips, we do a combined antiversion of about 45 between the acetabular component and the femoral component. If that combined version is way more, you, you need to consider rotational osteotomy to address the defect. And that's through the subtrochantric region, and uh, it can be achieved using various components. And the most versatile component that I, I was always taught was the SROM, but it's got two different parts and that's the problem for me. Um, so it, it, is, it is quite useful to address version uh, and I'll show you how. Like for example, this patient, that's a femoral, that's a leg, that's a femur and the neck is pointing anteriorly. So when you place the sleeve of the stem, it's quite anterior. And when you put your, if you put a straight stem, you can't address that problem. Uh, so that's where the sleeve helps and then you can rotate where you want to place the femoral component. And this is the very same patient. Um, where the sleeve is actually pointing at us and pointing anteriorly. So that's why I think these kind of modular stems are useful. Now, this is the, uh, it's a monoblock. So this is where I think this um, uh, tapered fluted stem play is much easier to use compared to the SROM because the SROM has different parts. This one is useful. It's just got splines and it actually catches or engages uh, the two parts of a femur should you do it uh, with an osteotomy. I think that's where this plays a, a significant part uh, for me. And as you can see in this, this uh, patient uh, is a low dislocation uh, and you can link the two parts with a subtrochantric osteotomy. You can use wires if you want to and a bone graft superiorly uh, to augment fixation. The things that I was always taught was do not lengthen more than four centimeters. And I'm, I, I really can't find a reference for this four centimeters. And that's what is quoted. Some say five, some say four. I tend to keep it at four. With more than four, there is evidence that sciatic nerve can be compromised. Uh, so shortening is necessary. And that neurological uh, compromise is a significant problem that you need to understand when dealing with lengthening procedures. Uh, this is his, whether this is historic or not is debatable now. Uh, in case you have proximal, uh, you want to avoid anything going distal, so you can just consider the proximal femur resurfacing 
or the midhead resection or even a metaphyseal bearing type device. Now, a lot of these um, metal and metal is, is more or less gone, although some centers still do it. I'm not saying it doesn't work, uh, but it does in, in certain uh, groups. Metaphyseal, this has been removed from the market. It was doing quite well, but for some reason it's been removed. Uh, and in this kind of situation, it is useful. Uh, so whether it's historic or not is a question that many people can ask and debate. Uh, or you use a midhead, and this patient had severe femoral neck deformity that uh, one of my bosses decided to do a midhead, and it worked. And this patient, uh, you may think, how the hell is going to, this, uh, going to work? And th this is a three-year radiograph uh, of a midhead resection, uh, and I, I thought he was bonkers trying to do this, but it did work. Um, or a metaphyseal type. This is one of my patients where this patient had this plate put in uh, 20, 30 years ago and it's quite anterior and the screws uh, is very difficult to remove uh, because they were really welded in. So an option was to consider a proximal metaphyseal. I managed to remove two, but the others were difficult. So I did plan on a proximal metaphyseal bearing type. Now this is a eight year x-ray. So these patients are long-term uh, follow-ups that I've shown you. So they do work. Uh, or you can use a very short stem. Again, this was uh, this patient, this uh, is a silent uh, prosthesis which has been removed from the market, but this did work really well, especially if you have proximal femoral deformity. So you can think outside the box and just look at the proximal segment uh, to use. Uh, in DDH uh, resurfacing, it has been reported, and this is from uh, Holland Amstutz group, and uh, the results were really good. Um, and the thing that you need to worry about is because of uh, a lack of uh, weight bearing, the bones got osteopenic, so they don't do well in these. So here, midhead does work, midhead resection. So like in this one, uh, you can consider a dysplastic socket and a midhead uh, um, uh, femoral component. So in summary, uh, use of modern hip armamentarium is very important. And if you don't plan, you, you run into problems. And you should always have bailout uh, options. Uh, to, uh, and you may have to resort to traditional methods. And I can show you one of my examples later on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Cassie. That was an excellent lecture. Um, I don't know how the other mentors feel, but I think, you know, dysplastic hips, it's one of those topics that you can just learn. And then if it comes up in an exam, it's a gift because you can talk about all the different uh, ways to manage the acetabular deficiencies and the proximal femoral problems. Um, so that was excellent. Um, if you missed part of the lecture or if you want to watch it again, which I think would be worth doing, it will be available on both the FRCS Mentor website and the ORUK website. So what we're going to do next is the MCQ polling. So uh, Ruth is going to share the polls and we just want you to answer the correct answer. It's all anonymous, so if you do it as quickly as you can, then we can move on to the case-based discussions. Um, if you look at, if uh, those who joined uh, initially would have noted that in my second or third slide, I did mention that the lateral centerage angle of Weaver is 25 to 39. So 25, 35 is wrong. And now uh, you could debate why 39, but that's the figure quoted in the literature. Uh, less than 25 is dysplastic and over 39 degrees is, uh, is over coverage. So it's 25 to 39 is the right answer. We move on to the next question if you want. Yes, please. How does that work? So you just scroll down, there's a little toolbar to the right hand side oh, if yeah. you just okay. pull that okay. down. Yeah, okay. So the uh, yes, for, for a second question of high dislocation, yes, four centimeters is absolutely right. Um, as I said, the, some do say five, but I think four is what's quoted in the literature. So that's correct. Majority of you got that right. And uh, high dislocation, what segment? Uh, yes, it is the anterior wall and the anterior column. That's a segment which is hypoplastic and deficient. So this is what you should really consider and be very careful, especially when you're preparing to insert your acetabular component. That's, uh, other than the first question, I think the other two people have done really well, which is good. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Cutty. So I think we're gonna move on to some uh, questions that were asked. Um, yeah, honey, so this one? 
so the first question I think you've already answered is uh, lengthening, um, how much lengthening you can do before you can get sciatic nerve injury. Mm. Uh, you've answered that, mm. four centimeters. And um, the next uh, question is, um, how, how do you decide how much shortening of the hip do you do uh, to? So that's essentially planning and intraoperative assessment. So uh, if you if you with with your regular amount of force that you use to reduce the hip and you can't, uh, then you have to consider shortening. Okay, so you, because you do want to put excessive traction on the neurological structures. So in pre-op planning, you will find the amount of uh, where the femoral head sits uh, on the dislocated hip and where the true acetabulum is. So that distance is the distance you're going to bring the hip center down. So that's when you can decide if it is four centimeters or less, you can, you should be okay. Uh, but even if that is too tight, then you need to consider shortening. Uh, but beyond four centimeters, you have to consider shortening from that, from by templating. Okay, brilliant. Um, another question, um, how would you manage a mild or early stage dysplasia of the hip when they're not arthritic? Uh, so uh, uh, if, if under the age of 40, if they have a dysplastic hip, literature shows that by derotation osteotomies of the acetabulum, um, uh, which is a PAO, periacetabular osteotomy, depending on what type it is, um, they do really well. So they have to be under 40. Beyond 40, what happens is the articular cartilage results do tell us that they don't do really well. And that's from the gap, from the burn, burn group. So above the age of 40, so you need to consider, uh, be very careful um, whether an osteotomy is going to work or not. Okay. And um, so how do you overcome uh, leg leg discrepancies uh, intraoperatively? So uh, again, the, the, uh, you, the shortening osteotomy, uh, the, the, the pelvis is so compensated already, so that when you have done your shortening osteotomy, you'll be surprised that they often equalize, even though one leg is short. Um, and after a while, the pelvis does settle. A bilateral hips, perfect, because both you're shortening for the same amount, so they will do really well. So you can, with pre-op uh, templating leg length scanograms, you can assess how much you need to change uh, there, or how much you're going to shorten to equalize the leg lengths. Okay. And again, another question. I think you've already answered this. Um, how do you make a, well, I know you've answered this. How do you make your decision whether to use an augment or femoral head bone graft? Uh, so I use very young patients. If the fighting the femoral head is pretty good, uh, in good quality, then I can use that. Um, and I think that is biologic. Uh, and I use it. Uh, and older patients uh, above the age of 50 at the femoral head, when I, if I feel is not of great quality, I use an augment. Okay. And um, just uh, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, the discussion about uh, hip resurfacing in a dysplastic hip. Um, there are kind of recommendations about when to use uh, hip resurfacing, and they include large head size and male, so a good bone. Does a uh, dysplastic hip fit this category? I, like I said, I've told you before, it's, yeah, a, a, as long as the, the resurfacing, the femoral head um, is, should not be very flattened or because if it's not weight bearing, that particular part of the femoral head is very soft and osteopenic. And so resurfacing doesn't work very well in that situation. So there you need to consider mid head resection where you can take the head off and then put the metal uh, mid head type of prosthesis. Um, in a dysplastic hip, if you see the femoral head quality is pretty good, uh, then it will work. Uh, resurfacing as Harlan Amstrus has shown uh, that you have to be very selective in what kind of patients. And uh, in young fit males, it does work very well. And I, and I would, uh, in the exam, uh, qualify that exactly the way you've qualified the statement, only in a certain select criteria of yes. patients, young fit males with um, deformed head. Um, just in case uh, our uh, uh, candidates have uh, misunderstood that. Okay. Um, so uh, that's all the questions. If, there's, if any of the mentors have any questions. 
and if no other questions, we'll proceed to the next part. Okay, um, great. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to move on to a couple of case-based discussions and we've got two uh, volunteers um, for Mr. Cutty to um, go through the case discussions with. Um, so I think our first one is, uh, is it Yu Liang Ang? And we'll get you ready. Yeah, that's right. I am. Hi. Hi. All right. So, um, Mr. Cutty is ready for you. Have you? Yeah, we can see you. Excellent. Right, Mo. Um, so, this is uh, uh, your education department. This is a 75 year old female who is sitting in front of you, uh, and she's coming with obvious right hip pain. Can you just describe what you see on the x ray? In this AP radiograph of the patient's pelvis, there is a pathology in the right hip. I can see that there's an arthritic change with the decreased joint space, osteophyte formation. The, there is suggestion that this uh, could be a dysplastic hip with a shallow acetabulum. Can the, I stop you? How, how can you, on a plain x-ray, just looking at that? Do you think that's dysplastic? It will be... I will need to quantify that with various okay. radiographic measurements. I will use the center edge angle. Yes, as a rough guide, if you see the femoral head edge sitting outside the edge, that's when you should think that this is dysplastic. So as soon as you start saying dysplastic, you're going into a different path and you could go down a slippery slope where the, the examiner would feel that you're not talking, you, you, are, uh, you don't understand the, a normal and a dysplastic hip, okay? So familiarize yourself to what is more or less normal and what is a, a dysplastic hip, okay? So I can show you other dysplastic hips later on, as I've shown you in my talk, but this is not dysplastic. All right, thank you. Okay, so go on. So uh, you, you've told me, you've, you've uh, described the features of lack of joint space, osteophyte formation. Um, and uh, the other thing that you could think, uh, so she's sitting in front of you uh, and she says, Doc, what are you gonna do for me? What would you say? Well, I would like to find out her symptoms uh, and if she has, and how the symptoms are troubling her and her expectations as to what she needs to do on a functional basis. Okay. That's good. So you want, you want to find out more about her um, uh, and what sort of options you're going to offer for her. Um, so in terms of her comorbidities, she's fit lady, no issues. She's not on any significant medications. Um, she's living alone. She's a non-smoker. Um, and these are the radiographs. Based on these radio these findings, I would recommend a course of non-operative treatment with NSAIDs and a physiotherapy to make sure that she is well optimized before uh, discussing uh, surgical options with her. Okay, yeah, that's a good way of going about it. So you try to understand more uh, whether she can manage, uh, what sort of things uh, she can do and she can't do. Uh, so have a plan in terms of her activities of daily living. So the way I used to think about was, um, uh, can she sleep? Okay, think about from sleep. So get up early in the morning. Uh, can she put her shoes and socks on? Uh, can she go down the stairs? Can she make her own uh, breakfast? Can she go outside, uh, use the public transport? Does she need a stick? Uh, how far can she walk? So that kind of way told me that I wouldn't miss out on any activities. So that is how I used to, it's how you want to do it, that's up to you but it's one way of trying to uh, have uh, ways of describing activities of daily living so you don't miss anything. So do you foresee, uh, so, uh, so she's failed conservative management. Now what do you do? Well, I will discuss with her the option of a joint replacement surgeries. In this case, uh, seeing how she has failed non-operative. So she's she's going to ask me, so mm. what sort of uh, joint replacement are you going to put in me, doc? In, in her, I would consider a, a total uh, hip arthroplasty with, uh, uh, I would template uh, to no, see no, I, if... Uh, what was my oh, question? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what sort of total hip replacement would I perform yes. for her? Yes. So time is very precious because yeah. if you start dithering, the problem is then you lose time and then you go down areas where you don't want to. So templating is not what I asked. I asked you what sort of hip replacement would you offer this lady? I would offer this lady a cemented a total hip arthroplasty. Okay. That's fine. That's okay. Yes. That's all I wanted. Uh, so see, it's, it's, it's quite right. straightforward when you when try to think uh, what sort of answers. I think we'll leave this at that because we can go to other things later on. Is that okay, uh, Sean? Yep. Or Hannah? Yeah. Or Nikki, sorry. That's yeah. Perfect. Yeah. perfect. So um, I think the next person for... Um, the case-based discussion is CY, who we know quite well. So, um, CY, I'll hand you over to Mr. Cutty. Hello, I'm Mr. Ah, hi, CY. So here, this is a 60-year-old uh, lady who now uh, presents with bilateral hip pain and difficulty walking. Can you describe the uh, radiograph to me, please? Okay, this is an AP pelvis radiograph of a very mature patient. I can see that they are bilateral uh, hip protrusion. Uh, so what do you mean? What is the definition of protrusion? The you know, definition of protrusion is when the collar line or the iliosteal line, uh, the acetabulum go beyond the iliosteal line or the collar line. No. Yeah. No. Where uh, the femoral head goes beyond the iliosteal line, not the acetabulum. Okay, the femoral head goes beyond the iliosteal line. If your acetabulum is gone beyond that, that's coxa profunda. That's a different term. Okay, so remember terminology is very important. So when the femoral head crosses, that's the truth here. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, she's, got, uh, she's got this. So go on. So tell me what else yeah. do you see on the x-rays? There are also arthritic changes over the hip joint. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, I can see that the, the bones are osteopenic as well. Um, so this is a case of... How can, you, how can you say the bone is osteopenic on an x-ray? I would uh, not go down that route. So then the, the examiner will ask you, well, define osteopenia. The osteopenia is uh, the best to be assessed on the bone mineral density scan. Yeah, so is, is this a bone mineral density scan? This is a lot. Yes, so don't go down areas where you, you, you're not asked to go to, okay? Okay, yeah. just stick to what the examiner has asked you, and that's very important. So you talked about the ileoscale line. So what are the landmarks in the you look for? I'm sorry, so there was a problem. What are the landmarks that you, on, on plain x-rays, do you look for? You talked about ileoscale line, okay. I tell, me, tell me other things that you would look in, in a plain radiograph. In a plain radiograph, I also look up for other features. I think for this case, I will look for the integrity of the different columns uh, and the wall within the acetabulum. I will so look for what, what, what columns are you looking for? The anterior and the posterior column. So, so what landmark would you associate with an anterior column? Uh, ilio, uh, iliopectineal line. Okay. Uh, the ilioiscal line is for the posterior column. Okay. Mainly. I will check for the, the anterior and the posterior wall also. Very good. The, and I will okay. check for the teardrop as well. Yes. So what, what does the teardrop signify? It signifies uh, or, the, or, or a representative of? Um, I think it's a media wall. It's mainly the media wall of the You could say true, the true floor of the acetabulum. That's what many people associate the teardrop as. Okay. So the other things uh, you could, if you were to do a centerage angle, what would be the centerage angle for this patient? Will be increased. Yes. yes. So these are the things I would look at. So you would look at a the um, 
uh, ilioischial line, which in normal, see where it sits to the femoral head. Uh, this is the iliopectineal line, as you rightly said, for the anterior column. The center ridge angle in normal is 25 to 39. And in a protrusion, it's way over 39. And as you, as, as you said, the femoral head, it goes medial to the uh, ilioischial line, and that's when it's defined as protrusio. If the femoral head sits lateral to the ilioischial line, and the floor of this acetabulum is actually medial to the ilioischial line, that is coxa profunda. Okay? I agree. Shall we leave it at that now? Okay. okay. Perfect. Um, excellent talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Satish Kati, uh, uh, Mr. Satish Kati. It's a uh, very, very succinct, exactly what we need for the FRCS. And also you've demonstrated that for the FRCS, uh, time is very important in your question, in your, uh, in your five minute write-up for each question. Also answer the question, which is a very important technique. And uh, focus on the key things. So, for example, in this one with the uh, profonda, I, the most important clinical imp information that you need here is that you're going to have to cut the neck in situ because you're at risk of fracturing. Um, and you didn't get to that. Uh, so, no, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, well done, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Nikki. Hey, thank you, everyone. So, we are going to stop the recording now.